Hey everyone, uh, today our guest is Ryan Amps, who is a managing director at Harbor Group Management. Uh, welcome, Ryan. Thanks, guys. So, uh, can you first start off by telling us what does uh, Harbor Group do and what role do you play in that company? Yeah. So, Harbor Group, uh, we are an invest real estate investment platform, and we pretty much do a little bit of everything. Our main focus is going to be on um, apartments that we own through equity, uh, but we have a lending platform, invest in securities, uh, hedge fund, and then we also have office buildings, retail properties, industrial properties. So we, it's a little bit of everything. I'd say about 75% of our portfolios in, in apartments, though. Um, but we try to just branch out as much as we can. And what do you do for? And you, it seems like you've worked there for yeah. for a long time. Right? <laughs> Forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I work. I've been there for just about a little over ten years total, and um, I work in asset management. I've done that the bulk of the career, but I've, I've been in a couple other roles as well there. Um, so asset management for us basically means uh, we sit in the position of representing the investors and the owners and executing the investment strategy. Um, so we take the deal, look at due diligence, work on the underwriting and the budget. And then once we purchase the properties, basically kind of execute that strategy from an investment side, including any refinancing, sales, or capital decisions. And then we also have our management company, which will handle the kind of day-to-day -day operations. So they'll do the leasing, you know, they'll fix your, your door, it's broken, they'll con uh, schedule contractors, go mow the lawn, anything that needs to be done at the property level. <laughs> So since you mentioned, you know, apartment buildings are a big uh, focus, uh, although you, you guys do a lot of different things, what does someone bring to you uh, in, in a deal? Like what are the parameters you look at and evaluate before you make a decision or a suggestion? Uh, well, well, for us, like we typically will source everything ourselves and very rarely, you know, we'll have somebody bring us a deal directly other than a broker who's trying to sell it to us. <laughs> um, but we're looking at returns at the end of the day, and it's, it depends on the type of property, um, but whatever the investors are looking for in that, in that um, scenario. So we, we tend to invest in funds, so they, they're pretty much homogenous investors, but some of them may prefer like a longer term deal with lower steady cash flow, steady stable cash flow. Others may want more upside um, less upfront cash flow, but more upside down the road. So it kind of depends on that, but but typically, you know, at the end of the day, you just go to the returns, see what they're looking for there, I mean, and then work your way up. So part of our role will be to vet a lot of those assumptions that get down to the cash flow and distributions and returns, looking at things like the rents, operating expenses, any capital needs at the property, and then I guess like the debt raising. So how are we going to finance it? So when you're talking about investors, uh, does that mean you're not uh, investing 100% into every deal? You also secure other other investors? So, the, I mean, there's a variety of structures you can do in the industry, but but the typical one will be just a 10-year fund. So most companies will raise like a 10-year fund, deploy it in three years years harvested over the next five to seven years for us like we're a little bit different in that we raise funds more frequently but essentially like all of our money goes into each deal from the funds and then in, and then in certain situations um, if it's a particularly large deal or portfolio you may bring in a partner to either help you because you can't raise that much amount of money or you don't want to put that much amount of money into a deal um, so we've had a couple portfolios that were for example like greater than a billion dollars. And in those cases, we were just not comfortable, you know, putting that amount of money from our funds in there. So we brought in partners for each of those um, to take some of the burden. <clears throat> That's right. That's actually super interesting. I didn't know there were like timed uh, or, you know, like a, like 10 year fund. It sounds like a, it's like a VC firm to some degree that, that invests in, you know, private companies. I mean, we're essentially private equity you know, as, as any other private equity fund. We just invest in real estate instead of companies. And so it's it's a lot of the same basic concepts. Um, and I think a lot of people lose lose sight of that. I mean, the it's a building at the end of the day. And so there's there's the structural cost, there's a fixed cost about you know, actually maintaining it, but there's a staff there. You know, it's kind of like buying a store, right? And instead of selling shoes, you're selling apartments. So it's kind of the same idea. And you know, at this point, you know, we look at ourselves probably more as almost as much as an operating company as a real estate company. And we have, you know, hundreds of employees that are helping us to run these, run these properties and sites and, and generate the returns. So it's it's just as much people as it is um, you know, properties and in and, and land. Okay. This is good. Let's take a let's take a quick um detour of this, which is so a lot of people who listen to this podcast are either looking to 
buy their first home or or invest uh, in a property, and it could be multifamily or you know if they've got the means, maybe something like uh, like a, an apartment building. How does you know from from what you've seen, maybe not for for Harbor, but just uh, if you were just uh, you're, you're interested in doing a deal for yourself and you want to buy like I don't know a thirty unit apartment. <laughs> How would, how would that work? Because I've, see, I've seen people do it. Uh, I, I don't understand the mechanics behind it. Like you have to set up like a special like purpose vehicle and then people are just like investing into that and then you buy the property. Like how, do, you, do you have any ideas of, uh, of how that works? Yeah, I mean, it's they're hard to find, right? Because who's brokering those deals? You know, they're not necessarily on Zillow. So if you were going to look for something that you could you could take down yourself, you have to kind of find it on your own a lot of times. Occasionally they'll they'll pop up, but so that's one thing. And then you know, in theory, you could buy it yourself in your own name, but it it all just falls into the liability category of you know might as well put together an LLC or an LP, particularly if you're raising funds from somebody else. So tax purposes and and liability purposes, I think I think you 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 form those entities to help protect yourself. But but again, if you're going to raise with friends and family or other investors, it's easier just to structure it that way. Yeah, because when I when I go to AngelList, they have lots of uh, <laughs> options now where you could, well, you could also do a lot of like private investing, but you could also set up like a, a real estate syndicate or set up a syndicate to invest in real estate as well. Uh, Jason? Yeah, uh, piggybacking on what John said and maybe kind of taking a step back. So, you know, a lot of our listeners are going to be more first time home buyers and they're not probably not taking down 30 unit apartment complexes, but I think where, you know, you can really help them out is, uh, is obviously you guys are finding these, uh, you know, these buildings in these, these places. Um, and so I imagine like site selection, you know, state city kind of location is huge for you guys. Can you maybe shed some light on, you know, what are the things that you guys take into account when you're, when you're trying to find a, a property, um, you know, is it school district, is it population income, uh, you know, kind of what are your major factors that maybe people should look for if they're trying to, you know, maybe move out, especially when we're seeing people that are able to move away from the office and work remotely get other areas, you know, either for primary residences or even maybe a single family residence or a duplex, something like that, something residential, uh, you know, what kind of guidance could you give to them to, you know, find places where, uh, you know, they'd be investing, you know, in, in a good location? Yeah, I mean, we're pretty much across the country now. So it's hard for me to <laughs> to pitch one city over the other because we pretty much took them all. So I think I think that goes to show you that you can find the value anywhere and then maybe on a more micro location, get more specific about location. But at the end of the day, like the main the main driver is employment. You know, are there people that are moving there for work? Are there jobs to be had? Can they pay the rent? Do they need houses to buy? It's as simple as that. And we do look at things like, you know, school districts. We look at things like crime. We look at the conditions of the property, how much money we need to invest in it. But you can make the return anywhere. We have properties for me, like just in my own portfolio with the company, like I have one in downtown Brooklyn, a brand new luxury building, amazing, all the amenities. And we have properties in New Jersey that, you know, you couldn't find the many, couldn't find a pool, right? Nothing there. And they're, they're in rural areas. And so between the two, they both work. And it just kind of depends on what you're looking for and um, the conditions of that property at the time that you're, you're buying it. At this point, like there's so many people looking that a lot of those, you know, opportunities are kind of picked over. And they're priced appropriately. So you're not you're not going to find maybe as many as many good deals maybe on our level at least on a on a smaller individual level. Perhaps that's that's the case with like a duplex or house or or something like that where you may know more about what's going on like local development wise. Um, so I guess that'd be maybe the last thing that we look at is development, but like infrastructure, so like transit, access to highways, access to how do you get in and out of the area. And you may see things like new train stations pop up or you know bus lines being delivered or parks being developed that down the road can help your, you know, the attractiveness of that area or that property. Hey, Ryan, with these uh, properties that you're buying, are you guys buying them, you know, doing the fixes and turning around and selling any of them, getting them up to, you know, market rate, or are you guys holding on to all of these properties? Yeah, it's a mix. Uh, historically, we tend to hold it for like a relatively short amount of time for like three or four years and then sell it and be more IRR focused. Other times though we've had investors come in that just they don't want to sell they just want to have their cash out there earning a return and so we look at them more for like a five to ten year hold you know stable cash flow nothing too exciting but you need to put your money somewhere right and at this point in the in the market i mean where are you going to put it equity is crazy high debt is you know super low rates and so real estate has become kind of that sweet spot of trying to find like safer return, but still get some yield on it. 
So you mentioned um, some investors want to, uh, you know, sell it. Some, some or some some investors want to cash flow. Uh, who do you sell it to? Um, it's a lot of just trading hands, right? And it seems like I don't think we've ever bought a property twice. So at least I could say that. But but a lot of times you see the same repeat transactions with the same people. And I think I think some of it is you've just kind of reached the end of your business plan and it doesn't fit in your box anymore. Maybe you got the return you wanted, or maybe you ran out of money because you spent it all to improve the building and, and you don't have any really cash to improve it left anymore. And it's just time for you to move on. But somebody else will come in with their own plan. Sometimes it's like a hammer looking for a nail, right? You're always looking for something to to pitch. Um, but for the most part, it's been it's been a strong upward trend for so long that there's always something left on the bone. And like cyclically, you, you know, think of just like inherently like styles change. And so take a house or a duplex, like you go renovate the kitchen five or 10 years, somebody's going to want to do it again, right? And people pay for that because they want a lot of times they want the newer, nicer thing. And um, there's always kind of that opportunity to, to put your own spin on it. Got it. Uh, oh, Jason, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. So, uh, you know, you mentioned that things that are you know, left over right now, it's kind of picked over, right? The equity market's super hot. Nobody wants to put their money into debt. So real estate is where where a lot of people are focusing their time and effort. Um, but I know we've obviously, COVID has changed things dramatically. And especially, I would assume in, you know, your uh, scenario with all of kind of the the rent and eviction moratoriums, all those types of things. I'm just wondering kind of what is your thoughts? Like what happened, you know, to your guys' portfolio throughout COVID? What were you guys thinking? Where do you see it going? Uh, you know, give us the give us the COVID update. I mean, what a crazy time. The your, your perspective kind of changed by the week, it seemed like, right? And so when we first started to see some of the cracks in like April or May last year, um, we got very, very conservative and, you know, conserved cash, um, wasn't sending out distributions at really any material level, stopped any capital projects or any capital investments. And frankly, like it was kind of, I'm glad we did it, but it was kind of unnecessary at the end of the day um, because for the most part, things kept going. And what you saw was like very market dependent. So a lot of people fled New York and San Francisco and DC. So those markets in Boston, those markets were really, really tough. For the last up until maybe like last this june for the 12 months uh, prior to that but the but the markets like phoenix and denver and texas were super hot <laughs> everybody was leaving those markets to go there and so it's like very much a tale of two worlds for a lot of 19 and 20 um in terms of like performance so it kind of makes your head spin when you're looking at the reports and like one property is up 20 percent, another one's down 20 percent. Um, but it's a little bit of just like you know redistributing where people live now everybody's kind of still going back to the cities and we're still seeing those increases and in that sort of uh, performance on the like secondary markets or the Sunbelt markets. Um, but we're still seeing it pick up now in the major markets like New York, Boston and DC. So I'm scratching my head a little bit because I can't, can't quite understand like how they're both doing so well. Um, but maybe it's just lack of supply and, and more demand on, you know, housing shortages are really everywhere, right? So that could be part of it. Um, on the collect, like on the rent collection and evictions and, and all that stuff. I mean, it wasn't as bad as we thought. I think industry wide, like you would see maybe like 5% of the people didn't pay the rent, which grand scheme of things, like not too bad. Um, certain markets worse than others, uh, of course. And again, in those hot, in those like markets that people are going to almost no issues paying rent in the markets like New York, DC, California, more. Um, but I think in a lot of cases, the, I mean, the government stepped up and paid for, a, you know, a good chunk of this. And I think it's been a little bit of a struggle, like just think of the administrative burden of having to having to allocate all this money. But for the most part, people are trying to do the right thing and, you know, wait on the evictions, pay, pay for people that need it. Um, but it's just been it's been tough to kind of get that money out there. And the last thing that's been hard for us was, was of course, like the supply chain. So it, it definitely affects us, too. Um, things like your washing machine broke and, you know, it's on a boat in Long Beach right now. Right. <laughs> One one thing that was kind of I would have done in retrospect is like we paused on a lot of our capital programs, like renovating clubhouses or renovating properties or whatever for 2019. And then we started them up again in 2020, like everybody else. And so it just kind of like exacerbated it all. Uh, and so for 2020, it was like a lot of just, sorry, 2021 was like a lot of like pulling my hair out, trying to like get the parts in or like trying to get a vendor to answer your call or get the projects done. And 
maybe it was uh, not worth the effort at, time, at times, but at this point, we're pretty much done. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, location specific, you know, like states, you saw big, you know, disparities in, you know, people leaving, people coming, uh, things like that. Did you see it on a more granular level? Like if I kind of think about it, you know, what I would, yeah. what I would expect to see would be, you know, more like property, like class type, my A-class properties, you know, those people seem to be getting raises, making more money than ever working remotely. Whereas, you know, my C-class properties, those are the people who are, you know, getting laid off. Those are your, your restaurant workers and things like that. Did you notice any, any, thing on a more granular level like that? So there's some like micro locational kind of trends. So Boston for me was like the poster child of this. Basically, like as you went west from downtown Boston, it got better. Like downtown Boston was one of the worst markets last year. Cambridge was like the second worst. Waltham was like the third worst. And as you kept going west, it got better until you got more suburban and it was actually pretty strong. And that's because people were leaving downtown and going to the suburbs. They're going to the beaches or they're going you know, to somewhere that was more affordable. So you saw this like on, a, on like, a, on like an MSA level, a redistribution between the city and the suburbs. And then you saw it on a national level, people were leaving New York to go to Florida or whatever. Um, on the on the quote like the class of the property the it was it wasn't as cut as dry cut and dry as you think because in a lot of cases like those people that were living in the luxury properties kept their jobs and they could work remote so they left <laughs> so maybe they were paying their rent but they were moved to Florida <laughs> or they moved upstate or or wherever whereas like this the, the C class or workforce type properties you know they couldn't afford to leave to go somewhere else. And in a lot of cases, like that was actually, you know, the affordable rent, right? And so pretty early on, they were, the government was stepping in with like an unemployment benefits, uh, rental assistance. And, you know, the rents are cheap enough that like unemployment benefits could actually cover it. Like not my rent, right? <laughs> not in LA, but in some of these other markets, it was, it wasn't as bad on that level because of how quickly I think in a lot of cases, government stepped up. It's definitely like hits or miss, hit or miss, hit or misses in there. But um, uh, for the most part, I think it was it was a little bit like that. So on the topic of rents, uh, I mean, I'm just being cognizant of our audience base. A lot of them are renting because they, ha they haven't bought their first property yet. So even like me, you know, I'm about to move into a house next month, um, but I currently live in a property that's owned by, I think, a company like Harbor. It's called Essex uh, Property yeah. Trust. Yeah. Now... <laughs> question because I've always wondered about this you know if the quote unquote the landlord is, is a giant company how do you how, how does like a, a tenant even like negotiate rent do they would they even negotiate or they don't really care because they're just such a big company and they could good you know they could try to go find you know renters elsewhere uh, it's definitely harder it's definitely harder to negotiate I mean Essex is a is a REIT and so they have a different investor base than we would or maybe a different strategy than we would but for us we push a lot of that down to the properties and so I think you know I wouldn't be the one approving the rents I basically look at it from like a strategic level like here's our here's where we want to get to this year and let the property manager and we have revenue managers who work on the rents and the renewals and stuff too do the kind of deal by like uh, lease by lease negotiations so a lot of it is so first of all you're you have to watch out for like fair housing. So some of this is like restricted in, in what we can even do. Oh, I can't give you a deal and then tell the other guy, no, because you could be, you know, based on race or sex or, or age or whatever. But the other part of it is like, we try to take as much of the emotion and you know, qualitative elements out. And so we do focus like on a quantitative level on pricing. Like we have a revenue management system that will spit out the recommendations that say based on the time of year, and the type of apartment and what we expect to happen this year, here's what the renewal offer will be. And that's kind of where it starts. So like a lot of, it's not somebody in the background a lot of times, like plus 10, plus five, you know, marking you up each time. It's it's like a system and we can we can kind of hide behind that in a way. Um, but but a lot of it's just like practically, how can you scale if we have, you know, 50,000 units. So how can you, how can you scale if you're, if you're looking at all those without that system? If you're talking about, uh, you know, obviously, you know, renewal offers and things like that, uh, can you give our listeners any sort of uh, insight into just kind of what is happening with rents? Obviously, home prices have gone up, you know, dramatically. Uh, rents seem to be following now. You know, obviously, that would be something where you're going to, you know, be, you know, boots on the ground with that. Can you kind of tell us, you know, what you're seeing there, what what people should expect? Should you think rents are going to continue to increase at a, at a, a, you know, super high clip? It's hard to say. I mean, this is like unprecedented 
you know, never, never before seen in my lifetime, you know, rent growth at properties, we could see like 20%. It just like, how do you even like plan for that? So typically I'm, I'm on the more conservative side and, and I, you know, for the first half of this year, like, this is crazy. Like this can't possibly go on and just keep going. So when you think about that's, that's, so what I was quoting is actually on like new leases. And so for the renewals, like we would send out renewal rates that were like 3%. And they were like, oh, it's getting better, maybe 5%, and getting better at 7%. And it's, it's like, where do you even stop? We're like tiptoeing forward. So it's a little bit of uncharted water for everybody. And probably, I would say, arguably, the renewals have gone out too low this whole year. So to the extent that you saw, if you're renting a place and you got a 5% increase or even a 10% increase, you, know, you could look around and what are your options out on the street? Like if you went on Zillow or if you're in New York, if you're on Street Easy or, or whatever, Craigslist, you probably can't get a better deal because there's such a, a high increase in rents right now. And I think when you look ahead, for the most part, we expect that to increase, like continue for next year, unfortunately. I think a lot of this is just like general shortages in the market right now. People are working from home or they don't want the roommates. And really, we haven't built enough as a, as a country. And we haven't built enough in the right areas. So I think that's like systemic going to continue. Then on the other side, though, like there's there's a little bit of an artificial increase in occupancy right now or, or decrease in availability because of the eviction moratorium and because of the rental assistance. California, where we're at in Los Angeles, like you still can't evict people. They're giving rental assistance to people in need. But does that mean like there's less apartments available because of that? I'm not sure. And if those people start to leave, maybe that helps bring the rents down or the renewals down. <clears throat> but, you know, we'll see because they could just keep shoveling money on a, on, onto, the, onto, the, onto the property. So I think that's like one thing in the back of our heads, like looking into first quarter, for example, when some of those things will start to expire, will there actually be like a huge influx of evictions? I don't think it's going to be as bad as, as like the politicians would like you to believe, um, but but probably you'll see some turnover and maybe that helps, you know, pull the rents back a little bit. But I think again, until you're, until you get like development really going and people want to start bunking up again, <laughs> you're probably not going to see too much of a slowdown. Hopefully it's not 20% forever, but yeah, I think it's still going to be strong. All right. I want to talk about two things. Uh, let's talk about Zillow and then let's talk about REITs. So let's do Zillow first. Uh, and, and this one I'll pass over to you, Frank, since you're kind of in this business. So last week, uh, Zillow uh, basically announced that they're getting out of the, the house flipping business. They laid off 25% of their workforce. Um, yeah, Frank, I mean, you, you're out there. You're, you're flipping houses too. Uh, tell us about, have you ever competed against Zillow or or what do you think about the matter? Yeah, um, I, I could have maybe gone, you know, competed against them head to head, but I, I don't know if I would, you know, I don't really track like who's buying the house after the fact too often. So don't know, but the, the, I mean, even this last like year when I would be comping properties and I'd come across one that Zillow bought, I'd be like, what the hell? Like they're paying market for this house. Like they got to be making money somewhere else. So I think that's what they're trying to do is making money off of their convenience fee, which is basically their, you know, their, uh, since they weren't having commissions, you know, involved that, that that's basically what it was and trying to make money off of that, buy, buy the house for what it's worth, put a little bit, you know, paint it, put carpet in it, turn around and sell it. And it was like, we're just looking at it like, man, they're, seems like they're overpaying for these houses. And then that's and, and eventually, ultimately what ended up happening, why they, why they folded. I mean, first, what a week before they said we were going to stop buying for the end of the quarter. And then the next week they pulled out completely. Um, they're pretty underwater on, on a lot of those homes. Yeah. They, they basically, they, they got too aggressive at the beginning of the year and were paying, you know, but they were competing against the other I buyers, not necessarily like what I would be doing. So op open door offer pad, um, and they were giving examples of, you know, where they were competing against and they were just paying an extra five or $10,000 more just, just to buy the house. So Frank, so, uh, since they have, you know, I think in the United States, 7,000 homes, they're trying to offload. Uh, is that an opportunity, uh, for buyers? Because, you know, you were mentioning both, both you and Jason, that there's just not enough like inventory out there. Well, now we've got 7,000, which seems like a pretty decent number. You know, I don't. I don't even know if the the full seven thousand homes that they have are, are on the market. I think that they're looking at ways to offload them. Um, from what I've read, uh, they may not even necessarily be putting them on the market. They may be like selling chunks of them to to big 
big investors to, you know, buy 500 of them at a time or 200 of them at a time. So I, I don't, and the other thing too, like when you read the articles, don't get me wrong, 7,000 is a lot of houses. I mean, they're folding their flipping business, but I mean, how many houses are out there? Even if all 7,000 came across and the whole, across the whole, I mean, they were buying all over the United States. It wasn't just like in Orange County or, or in LA. So even, it, even if it did like send those full seven, I mean, the inventory is so low, I mean, what, what would it really do? So I, in my how opinion. did you know, if, how did you know if you were competing with them? Well, I didn't really ever compete with them directly because like I said, they were, they were paying market for the house. Um, right. But, how, so but I, how, how would you know? Like, how would I know if they bought it? Like if you were like bidding on the same house together, I'm just curious. I, oh, I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay. Got yeah. It. I wouldn't know during the transaction until they bought it. And then I could look at and see who purchased the property. Um, okay. I'll give you an example and the numbers might be just slightly off because I'm going off the top of my head, but there was a, a property in the city of Orange, I don't know, six or seven months ago and went and walked it, wrote up my offer and um, missed it by about $20,000. I think my number to buy it was 820 and I saw a $1,120,000 exit. So a wholesaler paid like $20,000 more than what we paid for it, turned around and flipped it to another investor for another 20 or $30,000. And I'm like, and I'm, tra I'm following this. I'm like, how the hell is this investor able to, I mean, they paid, my number was 820. They were up at like, I think 875, 900. Where is their exit going to be? The house was on a busy street, on a corner lot at back power lines. I'm like, you can't really push value here. This is a, a gut feel. So they turned around, fixed up the house, put it on the market and sold it for 1,135,000. So $10,000, $15,000 over my exit. Open door bought it. I'm like, why would Open door buy this? Flipped, what what are they going to do? Like open door bought it, turned around and listed it for one million one hundred fifteen thousand. So they listed twenty thousand dollars less than they bought. I'm thinking, what 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 is going on? And this was so I looked at it six months ago. It probably took four months for the renovation, the resale, and then open door put it on the market like a month ago. So I've been tracking it. Just a week ago, it went under contract. I don't know who's buying it. I don't know what they're buying it for. But just that whole thing was what we were kind of watching Zillow do. Like what what. I, and I, I hadn't seen Zillow bought a flipped property and I don't even know why open door did it. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand. Um, uh, Ryan or Jason, any other, uh, do you guys have any thoughts on the Zillow situation before we move on? Yeah. I don't know too much about it personally. It just seems like, I mean, they took a crack at it and didn't work out and have some pain in the markets, I guess, but yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's tough to like, I think the reason that, that, they didn't do so well versus like what we're doing, obviously scale wise, but like the stuff that we're looking at, you know, there's two, maybe three sets of eyes look, evaluating these properties before we finally pull the trigger where they're more relying on like a algorithm. Like it's yeah. tough. Like you don't know what the neighbor's house looks like. You don't know if it backs a freeway, you know what the inside looks like. Like, I mean, floor plan, like it's crazy to me that, that, that they could, but, you know, rely on that to accurately price homes, in my opinion. Jason, did you want to say something? Uh, I mean, I was just going to chime in. I, I I came across a Zillow property one time when I was looking for a primary residence of my own. And, uh, you know, it, in all honesty, for me, I was kind of blown away because, yeah, the same thing. It felt like they bid, you know, for the property they bought, it was definitely above market um, compared to like the one comp that had just sold it a couple months before. But then so then after kind of diving into it and talking to the agent, you know, they, they have that, that convenience fee, which is a gigantic rip. So they're making a ton of money right there when people think they're, you know, selling their house to Zillow and not really paying anything. Um, so they're really kind of gouging people there. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, they're paying the, uh, they've, they've obviously got a, an arrangement with the listing agents. So they're not paying a full, a full commission on it. You know, it's a flat fee. I don't know, maybe 2,500 bucks, whatever it is. So there was actually a ton of room for negotiation. Cause I remember nobody was really interested in this property. It was kind of in the heart of COVID before things started going up. And the agent was just saying, Hey, it's a Zillow property. Just submit an offer on it. And I was like, my offer is not going to even be the price that you guys pay their Zillow paid for it. And she's like, that doesn't matter. Like just submit an offer. And, and so, you know, internally what I'm thinking is, okay, so they, they made this big old rip on the front end. So now they got a chunk of, of money, a profit that they can kind of even dip into. So even if they sell it under what they paid, you know, there's still a buffer. They're not paying the listing agent really anything. So they basically need to be able to pay the, the buyer's side, uh, you know, and there's still a lot of meat on the bone for some profit, even, even if they sell it for less than they purchase it for. Uh, but I guess also a company like that's got so much overhead. There's just so much going on that uh, I guess when you just kind of compound it, there's just, you know, not enough margin in it. 
I'll just say, sorry, John, one, one last thing um, to kind of add to like, you, you need a, a more local base when, in my opinion, when you're buying real estate. I read an article in the LA Times last week and it was talking about specifically Open Door and the lady that they were interviewing people that had sold their house to Open Door and then people that had bought a house from Open Door. And this particular lady that they were talking to, she was a, like a part time real estate agent and she was kind of making a point that the people that she was dealing with at Open Door, they weren't even in LA. I don't even know where they were. They're out of the market. And this lady knew enough that she was able to actually tell the person that she was dealing with, hey, hey wait a second, I'm going to offer you this because this this house is in a bad neighborhood which one and it wasn't it was one of the better neighborhoods of the city but she told because she was a real estate agent hey this is a crappy area i, I i'm going to offer you forty thousand dollars less than what your list price is and they said okay and they did the deal and then she's like it was in the good neighborhood but they don't have a local base so they didn't know and i was just like i can't believe she <laughs> said that and but it does make sense i mean you know they're basically dealing with like a customer service person on the phone maybe florida I don't know, Texas, and they're selling real estate in Southern California. It's, it's crazy. I think the moral to the story is don't trust this estimate. <laughs> oh, actually, Jason, that's exactly what my takeaway was. So I have two takeaways from this, combining kind of all the stuff we've talked about real estate and, and, and technology as well, which is the estimate is designed, um, when you think about it, as a traffic driver to Zillow, Right. So people are using these estimates to look at their own homes or, or potentially maybe, you know, a, a property they want to buy. So uh, the algorithm is incentivized to provide like a higher number, right? Because if, if it's like a, an average price or mediocre price, you don't get the wow factor. So these estimates, I believe, are just going to be on the higher end. That's why it's crazy when, uh, when Zillow was making the cash offers for flipping, they use this estimate because they want to put the trust behind it. So they're using their own juiced up numbers to put the offers out for, for areas where they don't have boots on the ground. So that's number one takeaway from like a tech perspective. The second takeaway is it's kind of nice that, um, you know, in this case, uh, Zillow, Zillow uh, failed in this endeavor. And, and maybe I think, you know, Open Door ha has some minor challenges as well, because it shows that uh, at least in residential real estate, you know, there's still some homework you can do. There's still like some value that can be done by uh, working with like a small local team to go, to go like find things. So I find that to be pretty cool. It's like a, you know, the, the, little, the little man can't theoretically win. Um, okay, let's turn it over to REIT. So uh, Ryan, you mentioned that SX was REIT. What is a REIT? And uh, I guess, how is it different than, you know, how is Essex different than, than Harbor? They're doing the same thing or are they not doing the same thing? I mean, we'll typically like own the same types of properties at the end of the day, no, no different there necessarily. Um, but it's more probably from like a holding perspective. So they, they tend to hold their properties longer term, something you can invest in over time and earn that cash flow. Um, whereas we're more, we're almost like a, like the flipper of commercial real estate in that sense. Like we're going in, we're improving the property, we're changing, we're just like repricing the rents and then selling it. So that that's probably like the main difference. And then it's a little bit, then it like it's a little bit driven by that kind of drives like what markets they're in. So you see a lot of those bigger REITs in like the New Yorks, the San Francisco, the LA's, where you get that stability of cash flow and then long term appreciation. You know, when you're holding it for 10 years or so, like LA is a great place to be because it's only going up and up and up. Maybe not such a great place to be in like Salt Lake City or something where you have more fluctuations between the years so i think that's probably like the main difference but at the end of the day like we would they if they sold like we would look at the properties to buy and vice versa um and then there's a little bit of just like branding um that they can do above and beyond us and like operating platform efficiencies beyond us because they have you know that length of time to either establish the brand or to like instill those operating things so yeah, if we're only only holding a property for us like three or four years, it's hard to establish that brand in that amount of time, or it's hard to like pencil out, you know, like a technology investment, for example. Oh, it's going to pay back over if it's not two years. Like it's tough for me to say yes, right? That's kind of the the main differences. But otherwise, um, and actually, the one last thing is like they would have more strict like or more restrictions on I guess what they can invest. So being private for us like allows us to like I said, kind of kick the tires on a lot of those different areas versus. Most of the REITs are like, we're only office in CBD markets. We're only apartments in West Coast markets, you know? So 
So that's probably the last difference I would say. There's just so many like intricacies in real estate once you dig into it. It's crazy. <laughs> like I, even even for my uh, purchase recently, you know, they were looking at what other properties I own. And I co-own a, a co-op with my mom in New York. Right. And then after all this like legwork and researching and whatever, I realized that actually I don't own, you don't own real estate when you own a co-op. You own shares <laughs> in a company that owns the real estate. So yep. all this like hoops I had to jump through was a moot point because they didn't count it as real estate at the end of the day. So it's just, there's so much, like it's an endless career in, in real estate. I yeah. Think. I, I think it's super interesting. Like the more you get involved in it and you know, I, I would just like walk around like in New York, especially just like, look, look, just look at the buildings and like, they're just interesting to see them and then like, think about like what's inside them. But then you dig a little deeper and you think about like the zoning behind it and like, how do they draw the maps and like, what's the history behind this parcel? Um, you know, what, what else is going on in that area? And you can see like some of, so for some of our properties, like you get the, the condo documents and they're like a hundred years old printed on like a typewriter. You got to like read through them. You can kind of like trace back your history. It's kind of interesting to see that in like the title reports and the zoning and, and stuff like that. Sometimes some not so pleasant history comes up. <laughs> so what's the um, kind of like, dream scenario that all or many folks in commercial real estate aspire to? I think for like real estate, especially maybe for the people listening, I think the dream is you just have cash flow, right? Like, like for us, it's my career and I get paid to do it, but you can make a lot more money just buying and renting them yourself in a lot of cases. So to work for this massive company, you could do more just as a small local guy a lot of times. Um, so so in terms of like the real estate investment game, like you would be great to own a few properties and just live off them, right? Own them forever, never have to work. <laughs> um, and then if you're lucky, like keep building that portfolio and continue to amass wealth from like the commercial perspective, like a career perspective, it's a pretty shallow industry. And so you know, you have the typical roles of like analysts, associates, and VPs, and and, I, and I, um, all that stuff. But pretty much like three roles: it's it's going to source the deals and acquisitions, it's source the capital and investor relations, or it's what I'm doing, which is like running the strategic aspects of the investment. Um, and and I would say like the acquisition side is obviously like the sexier one, where you get to you know say you you go found you went and found this deal or this big property and you made so much money off it but um they all kind of work together at the end of the day and so you don't you don't escape any one regardless of where you work within a group and i think maybe Sorry, like was, i guess what was it? you said there are like three major roles like source the deal source the capital yeah so like for us we would have like our acquisitions team we would have our asset management team and then we have our investor relations team. And and for example, like when we're looking at a property to buy, like all three of us are working together on everything. So I'm doing more of like the, the due diligence on the property and the and the business plan and the strategy and investors are, I'm working with the investor relations team to tell that story to investors. I'm working with the acquisition team to tell that story to the investment committee. And so, you, like I said, it all kind of works together no matter where you are. It's just maybe a preference at that point. And then I was going to say like, I mean, development's always probably like the sexiest place you can be, it seems like, especially in the major cities. It's like, it's kind of a cool story, right? Like, here's this thing that I built or like, not, maybe not literally yourself, but like you put the designs together, you found that parcel and like you changed that landscape, like literally for what we're doing, like we're just taking a property, slapping some paint on it or improving it, it's still the same property. So it's kind of cool, I think, to see to see that building that maybe wasn't there before you started and be able to say, you know, I helped build this. So going back to this, uh, you know, real estate investment game where you have a, a ton of cash flow. So Frank and Jason, you guys were telling me uh, a strategy, a name of a strategy uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what, what was it and does it relate to this at all? Yeah, so I think we we talked about a couple of things, but I think uh, the one you're referring to was, uh, was the Burr method, right, Sean? So the, yeah. the Burr method, it's uh, buy, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, which um, I don't know, we'll toss over to Ryan, but I assume that's kind of similar to what you're doing. You're, you're getting in, you're, you're you know, uh, making improvements so that you can increase the rents. You know, you might refinance it to maybe pull cash out, you know, change the, the debt on the, on the property, um, you know, and then you're just going to continue to repeat that process. Essentially, yes. Um, the one thing that's like the one asterisk I say is like all of our deals are typically like standalone. So what happens is like the investors then come back and put their money back in with us. 
but we wouldn't necessarily be able to take that money and then go buy the next property with it. But when you give them the returns, they come back and they're ready to go, right? So, so it's kind of the same basic idea. And, and that's kind of where we talked about, where I was talking about like the IRR portion of like what they're focusing on. If in three or four years, I can give you a 20% IRR, you know, I'll come back and put it in the next one a lot of times. So final question for you, Rang, is about these uh, investors. Uh, how, how do you source an investor? Is it just like a high net worth individual? It's a company, like you, you have like a Rolodex of people who you've worked with in the past. Like, how do you find like new, new capital? Like how, how do people even find like, you know, Harbor? Um, yeah, I don't do a lot of that portion of it, but I think in a couple ways, like a lot of it's recurring. So once you get that that Burr method going, <laughs> you can uh, you can kind of recycle it. And so we, a lot of our investors have been with us for twenty or thirty years, and they used to put in a smaller check, and now they have more money, and they're putting in bigger checks. The other thing for us is like we 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 like to take down like big portfolios. So we took down a, a thirty five property portfolio a couple of years ago, two billion dollars, and like once the news gets out, like people will find you, right? To some extent, like there's only so many large deals in real estate. It's not like, you know, private equity or, or any other kind of investment like that, where you're buying out companies like property can only be so big. So when you have a larger portfolio and a larger deal, like people tend to gravitate towards you. Um, but there, I mean, there's, then there's like other, so then beyond us, like there'll be people that will help you raise funds, just kind of like on a broker level, there'll be capital partners that are looking to put in, you know, 80% of the deal you just got to go pitch to. So, Hey, I found this deal. I got 30 days to close. Here's the business plan. Are you in or out kind of thing? So there's a lot of that maybe on like the smaller company level. Um, but I think now that we're kind of at a size that's, you know, medium size, I guess, very much recurring. And then you'll see like a lot of larger investors, like, um, like endowments and insurance funds, and they just got to put their money to work, money managers. So they'll, they're always kind of out there looking. Um, and once you build that kind of scale and reputation, a lot of times they'll, they'll look for you. Hey, Ryan, so you kind of mentioned, you know, how it seems like maybe, uh, you know, larger money or companies are going to find out, you know, about these, these bigger REITs um, and things like that. But if we scale it down to, you know, just your, your average everyday person, you know, maybe somebody listening to this podcast, what are your recommendations? How would they find maybe a REIT if they wanted to invest in it? You know, where would they search or if they wanted to invest in Harbor, how would, you know, how would they make that happen? Um, I mean, for us, it's like, like not the word, but like institutional investor problem. Like you have to be or, uh, accredited investor, right? So, so that's like a little bit of a stumbling block for some of these companies, but I mean, all the REITs are online, you know, public information. And so you would do your own research based on what's available out there. But I think what's interesting, more interesting is you're seeing a lot of this, we're seeing a couple of things, like people wanting to get involved, like on the ground, like, like some of you guys are doing where you're investing in homes or flipping homes or whatever. Um, but there's also like syndications now popping up left and right, which I, I don't know like a ton about. I'm trying to learn more about this myself, but how can you get into like, uh, like splitting up the shares in like a, even like a house, right. Or, or a small property. So I think that is potentially interesting, but like at the end of the day, you lose, I think, a lot of that control that you probably gain on the smaller level. And why not maybe just get involved in like a REIT instead? And so it's a toss up for me, like you have to really know the bull, in my opinion, or you just take the safety of the REIT. Like you're still going to get like a 10% return on a REIT and it's pretty much a lock, right? So, so the safety there is, you know, probably much greater, but less upside. They're never going to be huge returns. Um, although I think it's like one of the top performing asset classes like the last 10 years. So hopefully that continues. But I, it, so anyways, I think I think you can look at it. I think you can look at it maybe more. I think there's like a lot of benefits to looking at it more like on the um, like local market level or you know, trying to find your own house or proper to find if there's any inventory ever that comes along. But it's, it's kind of being like that time of the market too, where like a lot of a lot more people want to get involved. And sometimes I'm like, but why? Like, what is your expertise? And do you want to just get involved, like just invest like in, you know, the, the market? So it's kind of like a sort of a maybe tongue in cheek, but like a lot of the times you can chart the market cycles, like based on uh, how many home improvement shows are on TV, like HGTV. <laughs> and it's like the dead giveaway, right? Of uh, the more they, they come out, like with flip this home or redesign these homes, like market's probably getting hot. And it's also like when your friends and family want to get involved. So I, I try to be cautious around that. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe this time will be the, the deadly words. Like maybe this time will be different, but who knows? Thanks, Thank Brian, for stopping by. Uh, yeah. Really appreciate your time today. No problem. Glad to be here.